Good morning. A.W. Tozer, in his most excellent book called The Knowledge of the Holy, it was in the first chapter called Why We Must Think Rightly About God. I thought that to be fitting to start this uh, study on the sovereignty of God, part two, uh, because we want to think rightly about God in all things and in everything, especially about God himself and we ourselves as God thinks about us. He asked this question at the beginning of the chapter, he says, or he asks, what comes into your minds or what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us? So you can ask yourself, what comes into your mind when you think about God? I thought about my lost state. My thoughts about God were few and far between. The Bible says that God is in none of his thoughts, speaking of the wicked and the unsaved. For I had no hope and was without God in this world, as are some of you. What are your thoughts about God? Are they worthy of the true and living God? When I think back of my lost state, I can see now that I was truly an enemy of God, a child of wrath. As long as we sing, as the song we sing says, against the God who ruled the sky, I fought with hand uplifted high. But thus eternal counsel ran, almighty love arrest that man. And I thank God that he did. Now my goal in this class is to glorify God as we fix our minds upon our great and mighty triune God, our sovereign God. Now right thoughts about God are not only worthy of him, but are due unto him. For you yourselves know that he is the greatest and best of all beings. Great is our Lord and greatly to be praised. And he has given us life, breath, and all things. And even our thoughts of God are acts of worship. And do we not seek to worship him in truth and in spirit? Now think with me here about these thoughts of worship. Remember, as soldiers in the Lord's army, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds casting down every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So bringing our thoughts into captivity is obedience to Christ, and this is worship to God. And there are times when we fight against ourselves to have right and worthy thoughts about our merciful triune God, who has called us out of darkness into the marvelous light of his Son. As someone has said, we have met the enemy, and the enemy is us. Brother Tozer also said that the mightiest thought the mind can entertain is the thought of God. In another place, Tozer says, a right conception of God is not only basic to systematic theology, but it is basic to practical Christian living, end quote. Now we are also known, we also know this in particular to the book of Ephesians, and the first three chapters are doctrinal, and the last three are practical. And that's just one out of some. One, or more, one more quote from Brother Tozer. The essence of idolatry is the entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of him. It begins in the mind and may be present where no overt act of worship has taken place. End quote. Another proof 
by Brother Tozer as well as Scripture that our thoughts are acts of worship. And our thoughts are what lead into actions. Whether holy or sinful. So we must be careful that though we are made in his image, and that has been terribly affected by the fall, that we do not try to make God into our image. Is not the battle in the mind? God says in a certain place, you thought that I was altogether like you. At times we do think that. Romans 8.5, if you want to turn there with me, Romans 8.5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. John Owen in his book called The Grace and Duty of Being Spiritually Minded, and it, we do need grace to be spiritually minded, and it is a duty of every Christian to be spiritually minded. He said that if men will not be spiritually minded, they will be carnally minded. You might ask yourself, are you spiritually minded or carnally minded? Are your thoughts glorifying to God, or are they not? Now, my purpose is and has been to prepare our minds to think rightly about God and to think about ourselves as God thinks about us. For we want to think God's thoughts after him. After I wrote that quote, I wondered where I got it. It was John Kepler. He was a great scientist, and he said as he was involved in his research, that he was merely thinking God's thoughts after him. Kepler and many other scientists were great because they started with God's word as the foundation of their thinking. And that is where we are to be as we walk this pilgrim journey. What saith the Lord in all things and in everything? As I said in our last study, the sovereignty of God, to know and understand the doctrines of grace, we must have an understanding and believe in the sovereignty of God. As our pastor and I discussed the direction I was to take, we agreed that there were still some thoughts to be considered on the sovereignty of God. So without trying to explain the unexplainable or darken counsel by words without knowledge, I shall proceed by God's enabling grace. The story of Joseph begins in Genesis 37. You can turn there if you'd like, Genesis 37. In my studies of the sovereignty of God, I wanted to continue to work my way through the New Testament. And if you start to study a doctrine of the Bible uh, and the sovereignty of God, you'll see that it is on every page. It's just everywhere. And how do you put this into a 45-minute message? Well, then part two, and then part three, part four, part five. No. But, uh, you know, I thought of even titles for our, sov our sovereign Savior. And then that would be just focused and fixed upon our Lord Jesus Christ and him being sovereign over the sea and the waves and the wind and over demons and devils and all the other things. And there's many, and that could be just a particular message in itself. And I hope that we will get through some of that if I don't carry on the, the, the uh, sovereignty of God and some of these other aspects. Uh, we will get to that when we go through the doctrines of grace. Genesis 37.3. We're just going to give an overview here, a few thoughts. Uh, about God's acts of sovereign providence in the lives of his people. Now Israel, Genesis 37, 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. 
Now the story of J uh, Joseph basically glows like this. I'm going I'm to skip on up the next chapter. I'm going to get to is 45.5 if you want to turn there. Israel, which was Jacob, his, his name is Israel now, and we know about the 12 tribes of Israel, and Joseph is one of these. And Joseph is the youngest of all his brothers, a fav favorite of his father, as we just read. And when he was 17, his father told him, he, Joseph had the gift of interpreting dreams. When he was 17, his father told him, go check on your brothers, they're tending the flocks, and bring word that they're okay. And I'm paraphrasing, but I'm getting to the story uh, just in an overview here. Some of you, probably all of you know about this story. So he goes from Hebron to Shechem, and that's approximately 15, 50 miles. John MacArthur in his study Bible helped me to understand some of the mileage, and I did double check just to make sure that he was approximately right through a little ruler, and you know, and that's where all my time went like yesterday. No. But uh, yeah, so from Shechem to, from Hebron to Shechem was 50 miles, and that's where they were tending the flocks. And so this young boy, 17 years old, travels 50 miles to find his brother out there. And a man sees him wandering in the wilderness, and he says, Whom do you seek? Who are you looking for? I'm looking for my brothers. They're tending the flocks. And the man told him, I heard that they were going to Dothan. And I, if I pronounce that incorrectly, forgive me. So Dothan is another 15 miles to the northeast. And mileage is, is, is important here because God is orchestrating and directing all of, all of the events in Joseph's life, including his brothers moving that far distance. Now that puts them right on the trade route of the merchants going to Egypt. So his brothers see him coming. They say, let's kill that. You know, they hated him. So let's, they, they threw him in a pit. I think it was Reuben that said, let's throw him in the pit. And they threw him in the pit, and they were going to have dinner. Then they seen a, a merchant coming along on the trade route going to Egypt. Judah, his other brother, uh, said, why should we kill him? Let's get something for him. So they sell him into slavery. And then the merchant's carrying him in, into Egypt, and he is sold into slavery, and Potiphar buys him. Potiphar find, so, sees that God is with him and that he is gifted and puts him in charge of all things that Potter has except his wife. And you know the story that his wife has issues with, with uh, Joseph, and uh, he is, he is uh, committed, he's uh, put in prison for a crime he didn't commit. Now from study of the numbers that he was 17, and then he was 30, and then he was 37, and all the numbers gathered together, we can assume that he was in Potiphar's house no more than 11 years, and we can assume also that he was in prison no less than two years. Because as he interpreted the baker in the, in the cupbearer's dreams, the baker would be hung or beheaded, and the cupbearer would be restored to his rightful position. And when the cupbearer was right, uh, restored to his rightful position, uh, it was two years later that the pharaoh had a dream about seven fat cows, seven skinny cows, and so Joseph, the cupbearer, remembered Joseph. I know a guy in prison who interpreted our dreams two years later. So then they go and get Joseph, and he comes out, and he interprets the dreams for Pharaoh. About seven years of famine, there would be first seven years of a lot of uh, harvest, and then there would be seven years of famine. So Pharaoh, again, sees that the Lord is with Joseph and puts him in charge of all these things. He's the ruler of Egypt under Pharaoh. So... We know that God is orchestrating all these events for a purpose. There is the covenant of grace that is being uh, uh, brought out, that is weaved through all the scriptures, and uh, the 12 tribes of Israel are being saved by this. If we go to, uh, what is it, 45.5, Joseph says to his brothers, Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither. For God did not send me, wait, for God did send me before you to preserve life. 45.7 And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So the 12 tribes of Israel are, 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 are coming, coming into the picture here. In Genesis 50, verse 20, 
We'll start at verse 19. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not. Now this is after, after the, uh, Joseph's father Israel has died. Now his brothers are thinking, Whoa, he's going to get us now. Dad's gone. So he says to them, And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I am in the place of God. But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. The covenant of grace, as I said, flows through the Bible exactly as God ordains it to be. In Genesis 12, 15, and 17, God reiterates the covenant of grace with Abraham. In Genesis 15, 6, God says, in Genesis 15, 5, And he brought him forth abroad, God did, and said, Look now toward heaven. And tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. 15.6 And he believed in the Lord, and it, accounted, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Exodus 1.5 And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were seventy souls. So what I'm getting at here is... The sovereignty of God in all the events in Joseph's life, even his brothers hating him, God did not permit that sin, nor did he play a part in it, but he allowed it to happen for a purpose. So all the souls were 70, for Joseph was in Egypt. Now, Acts chapter 7, Stephen gives us, Another picture of all the history of Israel. And in Acts 7.14, he says, Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him, and all his kindred, threescore, fifteen souls. So here, here's, here's the picture. Israel came into Egypt at 75 people. In Exodus, it talks about 70 because Joseph's family was not counted in that. Stephen knows that, so he counts them in and says, 75. 75 went into, into Egypt. As God told, let me not get a hold of my notes here. God told Abraham that the people will be in bondage 430 years. So Israel became a nation while in bondage. This wicked, hard life that was happening to God's people was for a purpose. So sometimes we can think about our lives. What happens in our lives, whether that be past, present, or future, we can look to the scriptures and get hope. When I started to learn these things, much light was shed. Illumination had taken place. I sought the comfort and got the comfort through the scriptures by hearing and understanding the sovereignty of God. In Psalm 139, it says, David's praying to God, he says, You saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book there were all written the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. And I don't want to get ahead of my notes here, so I'm going to return to them. Exodus 1.8, Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, and he knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Exodus 1.10, Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and it come to pass, that when there falleth out any war, they join unto our enemies and fight against us. So get them up out of the land. Then you remember, this is where Moses came into being. And I just talked about the 430 years they came in at 75 people, 430 years. They, they left at approximately 2 million. 
They became a nation while under bondage. They, they, they left at approximately two million people under the leadership of Moses. Moses, Moses had four, four, thir, three forties. Excuse me. He had three forties. His first forty was under uh, Pharaoh. He was in the house of Pharaoh. His daughter took him in, raised him as her own. He spent his next 40 on the backside of Midian, Midian, in the desert. And then God in the burning bush calls him and tells him to go and lead my people, tell the Pharaoh to let him go. The 10 plagues of, Is of, e uh, the ten plagues of, e of Egypt, God put upon them. He hardened Pharaoh's heart. It also says Pharaoh hardened his own heart. So we see there divine sovereignty in hardening Pharaoh's heart that he would not let the people go. But we know that Pharaoh, he would not let the people go because he hardened his own heart. So the scripture is true in both ways. God is sovereign. Man is responsible. In Romans chapter 9, God says, For this very purpose I have raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee. And certainly he did. Israel, or Israel's God was known of all the other nations. So the sovereignty of God is a comfort to many Christians in the past, present, and future. For we can consider the life of many martyrs, how they held this doctrine dear as they were burned at the stake. In the book of Job, we can think about how it must have been a blow to Satan's pride that Job never gave that puny little devil any credit, but said with confidence in our sovereign God that the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. There is an ancient heresy called dualism. Basically, it's ascribing sovereignty to God and the devil. It's not only ancient, it's also prevalent in our day, in some of the churches, probably many churches. Our God is not sovereign, if our God is not sovereign over the most minute detail in the universe, he is not sovereign at all. A sparrow is sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. This comes from our Lord, speaking the truth. There are times in our lives when we do not want to know or hear about God, who he is, or that he does what he wills. If we lean on our own understanding, surely we will dishonor God in our thoughts, which leads to actions which also dishonor God. This is setting our minds on the things of the flesh. John Calvin rightly said, we are idle factories from birth. And that is where man wants to make God into his image instead of seeing him in the image of God. We want, a, we want a God that we can understand. We want a God that does things the way we want him to. We want a God that thinks like us and does as we do. God has given us examples in the lives of Joseph and Job, just to name two out of many. Now truly these brothers of the past were spiritually minded. Ernest Resinger had said, he was a Baptist pastor, he died in approximately 2004. There are times when we have an inability to understand how something should actually come to be. But that is not sufficient ground for affirming that it cannot be. In other words, there are a lot of things that happen in our lives and we have no answer to, we cannot comprehend why, as Job. But we know from Job 38 on through the end of the chapter, God tells Job, he reveals himself to him in a whirlwind, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? God doesn't explain himself to Job for any of the actions that happened to him. He just says, where were you? Who are you to reply against God? God. 
shall the thing formed say to him who formed it? Of course, that's in Romans 9. Okay. That thought by Resinger, one more time, because it, it's, it's so clear and it's, it, it, it's hard to grasp at the first hearing, but it plays out in the lives of everyday people, such as us. We have an inability to understand how something should actually come to be, but that is not sufficient ground for affirming that it cannot be. Tell me how the stars hang in the sky and don't fall. If God blinked or turned his head, would they fall? Just a question. He upholds all things by the word of his power. As I said in our last study, we don't stand, we don't sit, we don't breathe without God giving us grace to do that, enabling grace. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Now when you think about that, we know that that isn't quantity, as in higher than our thoughts. That's in quality. As Jonathan Edwards said, God, if God were a being that we could comprehend, he would not be God. But he has revealed himself to us in the scriptures, and that's where we find our hope and gain strength and increase our faith. Those who know the name of the Lord will put their trust in him. The Puritan John Howe said, the name of the Lord represents all of his attributes. I am that I am. Brother William Cowper's hymn comes to mind. As you know, it's one of my favorites. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. Psalm 119, 67, 71. The psalmist says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I study your word. That's an interpretation of the scripture. That's another translation. Before I was afflicted, afflicted I went astray, but now I have kept thy word. 1971, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. So are there things in your life that you maybe uh, you can see? Uh, as I spoke on last, last time, I, I talked about how the, uh, the words of the wise are like the nails a carpenter uses to fasten things together, and the words of the wise are like, like a goad the farmer uses to move the animals along. I told that to my children this morning. I said, I have a goat and I'm, I'm the farmer you, moving you kids along. Get out the door. <laughs> so they hear the scriptures all the time like that. But, uh, <clears throat> so it's good that we are afflicted. It's good that a tree is pruned that it may bear more fruit. And for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now we know in part but then we shall know, even as also we are known. We will always be finite creatures, even in heaven. But we will know much more than we know now, and we will see much clearly than we see now. We will not have these type of glasses on to where there's a fog and a distance and we can't see, and we walk by faith and not by sight. Then we will walk by sight. We will see him clearly, for we shall see him as he is. Hebrews 12, 2, as we look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endeared the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider some of the things that we go through and then look to the Savior. For consider him that endeared such contradiction of sinners against himself lest you be wearied and faint in your minds, for we have not resisted to the shedding of blood. Fox's Book of the Martyrs is, is a, it's a book that every Christian should at least read a couple chapters of that. I mean, the book is just filled with brothers that have gone before us, as Hebrews 11 talks about. They were stoned, they were sawn in two. Uh, 
just numerous. And they walked by faith. Arthur Peake says, what does that mean? He says, walking by faith signifies that our thoughts are formed, our actions regulated, and our lives are molded by the Holy Scriptures. Can you turn with me to Acts chapter 2, 22 and 23? There's one thing with the sovereignty of God that you always want to express because in the sinful nature of man and even us as Christians, sometimes we get off of one side or the other as, as a, a ditch that we sometimes fall into, whether that be uh, leaning too much on the sovereignty of God or leaning too much on the responsibility of man. So there's a fine line walking this Christian life as as we do these things. And these two scriptures, there, there are numerous scriptures in the, in the New Testament uh, and, and if I had another time or another chance, uh, perhaps in the future, uh, we will go through some of those scriptures and just go through, uh, well, particular this one here. It's, uh, here we go. Acts chapter 222. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in your midst, in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and, ha and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Do you see any robots here? Those who speak by, uh, with, with words without knowledge, they darken counsel when they talk about sovereignty of God does nothing but turn them into robots. No. They just have a faulty understanding of these things. The sovereignty of God, uh, the scriptures say that thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. We talk about, uh, in the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, under, under, just to get a little bit of an understanding here, uh, it says that God hath decreed in himself from all eternity by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably, all things whatsoever come to pass. He has decreed all things whatsoever comes to pass. Yet so as thereby God, neither the author of sin, nor hath fellowship with any therein, nor is violence offered to the will of the creature, nor is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established, in which appears his wisdom in disposing all things and power and faithfulness in accomplishing his decree. The Puritans had a saying. Uh, I didn't know who wrote it, uh, but they have it saying. It says, what God has decreed in eternity, man will freely choose in time. As these two scriptures here say, uh, this was all decreed by God. He decreed that Jesus Christ would be crucified and slain by his determinate counsel, and it was in the covenant of grace that they made before the foundation of the world. There are two covenants in the, in the Bible, in this world, and the covenant of grace and the covenant of works. We are under and believe in the covenant of grace, by God's grace. I didn't think I'd make it here. Uh, <laughs> we have a few minutes, and I'm going to hit uh, just some things to prepare us for the doctrines of grace. And this is in a book uh, about the five points of Calvinism, and it's by Erwin H. Palmer. And he gives solutions to some of the things that are hard to understand. A, Arminianism. There are two ways to solve the problem. One is rationalistic and the other is biblical. In spite of all, our, all the Arminians appeal to the Bible, it is remarkable that at the point of God's sovereignty, he appeals to reason instead of the Bible. He correctly sees the problem, reconciling the two opposing forces of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. But in solving the problem, he substitutes man's reason for the Bible. <clears throat> 
He reasons that he cannot logically reconcile these two apparently contradictory facts, and they are facts. So he holds the one set of facts and denies the other. He holds to man's freedom and restricts, restricts God's sovereignty. In this way, he has no rational problem. The contradiction dissolves. I like the quote by Jonathan uh, George Whitfield. He said, man has a free will to go to hell, but none to go to heaven, until God works in him both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. The other side of the ditch is uh, hyper-Calvinism. Diametrically opposite of the Arminian is the hyper-Calvinist. He looks at both set of facts, the sovereignty of God, the freedom of man, and like the Arminian, he cannot reconcile the two apparently contradictory forces. Like the Arminian, he solves the problem in a rationalistic way by denying one side of the problem, whereas the Arminian denies the sovereignty of God, the hyper-Calvinist denies the responsibility of man. He sees the clear biblical statements concerning God's foreordination and holds firmly to that. But being logically unable to reconcile it with man's responsibility, he denies the later. Thus, the Arminian and the hyper-Calvinist, although poles apart, are really very close together in their rationalism. C. Calvinism, a paradox. Over against these humanistic views, the Calvinist accepts both sides of the antinom antinomity. Forgive me. He, re he realizes that what he advocates is ridiculous. It is simply impossible for man to harmonize these two sets of data. He says on the one hand that God has made certain all that ever happens, and yet to say that man is responsible for what he does, nonsense. It must be the one or the other, but no, it's both. To say that God foreordains sin, the sin of Judas, and yet Judas is to blame, foolishness. Logically, the author of the predestinated thief was right. God cannot foreordain the thief and then blame the thief. And the Calvinist freely admits that this position is illogical, ridiculous, nonsensible, and foolish. But the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. This is in accord with Paul, who said, The word of the cross to them that perish is foolishness. The Greeks seek after wisdom, logic. To them the Calvinist is irrational. The Calvinist holds to two apparently contradictory positions. He says, on the one hand, God has foreordained all things. Then he turns around and says to every man, your salvation is up to you. You must believe. It is your duty and responsibility. And if you don't, you cannot blame God. You must blame only yourself. I told a guy the other day at work, we were talking about some of these matters, and I said, if you do not believe, if you do not take hold of the salvation that God has provided, you will be cast into hell when you die. I said, there's mercy now, this side of eternity. But if you go there, you go there on your own accord. Men freely choose to go to hell. But if you do not believe, remember that it was God who worked in you. But if you do believe, remember it is God who worked in you both to will and to do according to his good purpose, according to his good pleasure. If you, press, if you do press on to lay hold of the goal of life, remember that Christ had laid hold of you that you may lo, lay hold of it. A.W. Tozer in his book, The Pursuit of God, said, I believe it was in his first chapter, Following Hard After God, he said, I sought the Lord only to find him seeking me. And I believe that's even a song that we sing or a verse in a song. In Jeremiah 29, it talks about this. It talks about the sovereignty of God and human responsibility. God talks about his thoughts toward us. For he says, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. And then you will call upon me and come and pray to me. And you will seek me and find me. When you search for me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back from the captivity where I've driven you to be carried away captive. God caused him to be carried away captive as he does some of us. 
And then he causes them to cry out to God, their responsibility, and God saves them. He says in the psalm, Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. Sovereignty of God, human responsibility. If you don't call, you won't help. In the face of all logic, the Calvinist says that if a man does any good, God gets all the glory. If a man does any bad, he gets all the blame. Man can't win. To God be the glory. In Jesus Christ, amen. Father, we thank you for these thoughts, these words. Thank you for giving me the ability to speak. Pray that it was all to your glory and that all was true. And we just pray, Father, that we'd be edified and further sanctified as we give glory to you in all things that we do and say.